Ahmad Shah Durrani c. 1722–16 October 1772 Pashto, Ahmd Shah Draini also known as Ahmad Khan Abdali, Ahmd Khan Abdali was the founder of the Durrani Empire and is regarded as the founder of the modern state of Afghanistan. He began his career by enlisting as a young soldier in the military of the Afsharid Kingdom and quickly rose to become a commander of the Abdali Regiment, a cavalry of 4,000 Abdali Pashtun soldiers. After the assassination of Nader Shah Afshar in 1747, Ahmad Shah Durrani was chosen as King of Afghanistan. Rallying his Afghan tribes and allies, he pushed east towards the Mughal and the Maratha empires of India, west towards the disintegrating Afsharid Empire of Persia, and north toward the Khanate of Bukhara. Within a few years, he extended his control from Khorasan in the west to Kashmir and North India in the east, and from the Amu Darya in the north to the Arabian Sea in the south. Durrani's mausoleum is located at Kandahar, Afghanistan, adjacent to the Shrine of the Cloak in the center of the city. Afghans often refer to him as Ahmad Shah Baba, Ahmad Shah the Father. Topic: <laughs> Early Years. Durrani was born in or about 1722 to Muhammad Zaman Khan, chief of the Abdali tribe and governor of Herat, and Zarguna Alakozai. There has been some debate about Durrani's exact place of birth. Most believe that he was born in Herat, Afghanistan. He was born as Ahmed Khan. Abdali's father suffered Persian captivity for many years at Kerman before being released from prison in 1715. As a refugee, he made his way to India and joined his kinsmen at Moulton. After he raised his family there, he was recognized as the scion of hereditary Sadozai chiefs. It is believed that Zaman Khan returned to Afghanistan to fight the Persians and his Afghan rivals, but left one of his wives at Moulton because she was in the family way. So other sources believe that, Abdali was born at Moulton in 1722, after which she returned to Afghanistan to reunite with her husband. He lost his father during his infancy. Durrani's forefathers were Sadoze, but his mother was from the Alakozai tribe. In June 1729, the Abdali forces under Dufakar had surrendered to Nader Shah Afshar, the rising new ruler of Persia. However, they soon began a rebellion and took over Herat as well as Mashhad. In July 1730, he defeated Ibrahim Khan, a military commander and brother of Nader Shah. This prompted Nader Shah to retake Mashhad and also intervene in the power struggle of Herat. By July 1731, Dufakar returned to his capital Farah where he had been serving as the governor since 1726. A year later Nader's brother Ibrahim Khan took control of Farah. During this time Dufakar and the young Durrani fled to Kandahar where they took refuge with the Gilgis. They were later made political prisoners by Hussein Hotak, the Gilji ruler of the Kandahar region. Nader Shah had been enlisting the Abdalis in his army since around 1729. After conquering Kandahar in 1738, Durrani and his brother Dufakar were freed and provided with leading careers in Nader Shah's administration. Dufakar was made governor of Mazandaran while Durrani remained working as Nader Shah's personal attendant. The Gilgis, who are originally from the territories east of the Kandahar region, were expelled from Kandahar in order to resettle the Abdalis along with some Kazilbash and other Persians. Durrani proved himself in Nader Shah's service and was promoted from a personal attendant Yasawal to command the Abdali Regiment, a cavalry of 4,000 soldiers and officers. The Abdali Regiment was part of Nader Shah's military during his invasion of the Mughal Empire in 1738. Popular history has it that the Shah could see the talent in his young commander. Later on, according to Pashtun legend, it is said that in Delhi Nader Shah summoned Durrani, and said, Come forward Ahmad Abdali. Remember Ahmad Khan Abdali, that after me the kingship will pass on to you. Nader Shah recruited him because of his impressive personality and valor also because of his loyalty to the Persian monarch. <inaudible> Rise to power Nader Shah's rule abruptly ended in June 1747 when he was assassinated by his own guards. The guards involved in the assassination did so secretly so as to prevent the Abdalis from coming to their king's rescue. However, Durrani was told that the Shah had been killed by one of his wives. Despite the danger of being attacked, the Abdali contingent led by Durrani rushed either to save the Shah or to confirm what happened. 
Upon reaching the Shah's tent, they were only to see his body and severed head. Having served him so loyally, the Abdalis wept at having failed their leader, and headed back to Kandahar. Before the retreat to Kandahar, he had removed the royal seal from Nader Shah's finger and the Koh-i Noor diamond tied around the arm of his deceased master. On their way back to Kandahar, the Abdalis had unanimously accepted Durrani as their new leader. Hence he assumed the insignia of royalty as the sovereign ruler of Afghanistan. At the time of Nadir's death, he commanded a contingent of Abdali Pashtuns. Realizing that his life was in jeopardy if he stayed among the Persians who had murdered Nader Shah, he decided to leave the Persian camp, and with his 4,000 troops he proceeded to Kandahar. Along the way and by sheer luck, they managed to capture a caravan with booty from India. He and his troops were rich, moreover, they were experienced fighters. In short, they formed a formidable force of young Pashtun soldiers who were loyal to their high-ranking leader. One of Durrani's first acts as chief was to adopt the titles Padisha i Ghazi, Victorious Emperor, and Dur i Durrani, Pearl of Pearls, or Pearl of the Age. Topic: <laughs> Forming the Last Afghan Empire. Following his predecessor, Durrani set up a special force closest to him consisting mostly of his fellow Durranis and other Pashtuns, as well as Tajiks, Kazilbash and other Muslims. He began his military conquest by capturing Ghazni from the Gilgis and then wresting Kabul from the local ruler, and thus strengthened his hold over Khorasan. Leadership of the various Afghan tribes rested mainly on the ability to provide booty for the clan, and Durrani proved remarkably successful in providing both booty and occupation for his followers. Apart from invading the Punjab region three times between the years 1747-1753, he captured Herat in 1750. <laughs> Indian invasions Early invasions Abdali invaded the Mughal Empire seven times from 1748 to 1767. According to Jaswant Lal Mehta, Durrani aroused the Afghans' religious passions to fire and soared into the land of infidels India. He crossed the Khyber Pass in December 1747 with 40,000 troops for his first invasion of India. He occupied Peshawar without any opposition. He first crossed the Indus River in 1748, the year after his ascension, his forces sacked and absorbed Lahore. The following year, 1749, the Mughal ruler was induced to cede Sindh and all of the Punjab including the vital Trans-Indus River to him, in order to save his capital from being attacked by the forces of the Durrani Empire. Having thus gained substantial territories to the east without a fight, Durrani and his forces turned westward to take possession of Herat, which was ruled by Nader Shah's grandson, Shah Rukh. The city fell to the Afghans in 1750. After almost a year of siege and bloody conflict, the Afghan forces then pushed on into present day Iran, capturing Nishapur and Mashhad in 1751. Durrani then pardoned Shah Rukh and reconstituted Khorasan, but a tributary of the Durrani Empire. This marked the westernmost border of the Afghan Empire as set by the Puli Abrisham, on the Mashhad Tehran Road. <laughs> Third Battle of Panipat The Mughal power in northern India had been declining since the reign of Aurangzeb, who died in 1707. In 1751–52, the Ahmadiyya Treaty was signed between the Marathas and Mughals, when Balaji Bajirao was the Peshwa of the Maratha Empire. Through this treaty, the Marathas controlled large parts of India from their capital at Pune and Mughal rule was restricted only to Delhi Mughals remained the nominal heads of Delhi. Marathas were now straining to expand their area of control towards the northwest of India. Durrani sacked the Mughal capital and withdrew with the booty he coveted. To counter the Afghans, Peshwa Balaji Bajirao sent Ragunathrao. He succeeded in ousting Timur Shah and his court from India and brought northwest of India up to Peshawar under Maratha rule. Thus, upon his return to Kandahar in 1757, Durrani chose to return to India and confront the Maratha forces to regain northwestern part of the subcontinent. 
In 1761, Durrani set out on his campaign to win back lost territories. The early skirmishes ended in victory for the Afghans against the Maratha garrisons in northwest India. By 1759, Durrani and his army had reached Lahore and were poised to confront the Marathas. By 1760, the Maratha groups had coalesced into a big enough army under the command of Sadashivrao Bao. Once again, Panipat was the scene of a battle for control of northern India. The Third Battle of Panipat was fought between Durrani's Afghan forces and the Maratha forces in January 1761, and resulted in a decisive Durrani victory. This brought Punjab till north of Sutlej River under Afghan control. Ahmad Shah Durrani vacated Delhi soon after the battle. <inaudible> <inaudible> Central Asia The historical area of what is modern-day Xinjiang consisted of the distinct areas of the Tarim Basin and Dzungaria, and was originally populated by Indo-European Tocharian and Eastern Iranian Saka peoples who practiced the Buddhist religion. The area was subjected to Turkification and Islamification at the hands of invading Turkic Muslims. Both the Buddhist Turkic Uyghurs and Muslim Turkic Karluks participated in the Turkification and conquest of the native Buddhist Indo-European inhabitants of the Tarim Basin. The Turkic Muslims then proceeded to conquer the Turkic Buddhists in Islamic holy wars and converted them to Islam. The mixture between the invading Mongoloid Turkic peoples and the native Caucasian Indo-European inhabitants resulted in the modern-day Turkic-speaking hybrid Europoid East Asian inhabitants of Xinjiang. The Turkification was carried out in the 9th and 10th centuries by two different Turkic kingdoms, the Buddhist Uyghur Kingdom of Kocho and the Muslim Karlik Kara Khanid Khanate. Halfway in the 20th century the Saka Iranic Buddhist kingdom of Khotan came under attack by the Turkic Muslim Karakhanid ruler Musa, and in what proved to be a pivotal moment in the Turkification and Islamification of the Tarim Basin, the Karakhanid leader Yusuf Qadir Khan conquered Khotan around 1006. Professor James A. Millward described the original Uyghurs as physically Mongoloid, giving as an example the images in Beziklik at Temple 9 of the Uyghur patrons, until they began to mix with the Tarim Basin's original Eastern Iranian inhabitants. The modern Uyghurs are now a mixed hybrid of East Asian and Europoid populations. The Turkic Muslim sedentary people of the Tarim Basin of Altashar were originally ruled by the Chagatai Khanate while the nomadic Buddhist Dzungar Orits in Dzungaria ruled over the Dzungar Khanate. The Naqshbandi Sufi Khojas, descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, had replaced the Chagatai Khans as the ruling authority of the Tarim Basin in the early 17th century. There was a struggle between two factions of Kojas, the Afaki White Mountain faction and the Isaki Black Mountain faction. The Isaki defeated the Afaki, which resulted in the Afaki Koja inviting the fifth Dalai Lama, the leader of the Tibetan Buddhists, to intervene on his behalf in 1677. The fifth Dalai Lama then called upon his Dzungar Buddhist followers in the Dzunghar Khanate to act on this invitation. The Dzungar Khanate then conquered the Tarim Basin in 1680, setting up the Afaki Koja as their puppet ruler. Koja Afaq asked the 5th Dalai Lama when he fled to Lhasa to help his Afaki faction take control of the Tarim Basin The Dzungar leader Galdan was then asked by the Dalai Lama to restore Koja Afaq as ruler of Kashgaraya. Koja Afaq collaborated with Galdan's Dzungars when the Dzungars conquered the Tarim Basin from 1678 to 1680 and set up the Afaki Kojas as puppet client rulers. The Dalai Lama blessed Galdan's conquest of the Tarim Basin and Turfan Basin. Since 1680, the Dzungars had ruled as suzerain masters over the Tarim, for 16 more years using the Chagatai as their puppet rulers. The Dzungars used a hostage arrangement to rule over the Tarim Basin, keeping as hostages in Ili either the sons of the leaders like the Kojas and Khans or the leaders themselves. Although the Uyghurs' culture and religion was left alone, the Dzungars substantially exploited them economically. The Uyghurs were forced with multiple taxes by the Dzungars which were burdensome and set by a determined amount, and which they did not even have the ability to pay. They included water conservancy tax, draft animal tax, fruit tax, pole tax, land tax, tress and grass tax, gold and silver tax, and trade tax. Annually the Dzungars extracted a tax of 67,000 tangas of silver from the Kashgar people in Galdan Saran's reign. A 5% tax was imposed on foreign traders and a 10% tax imposed on Muslim merchants. People had to pay a fruit tax if they owned orchards and merchants had to pay a copper and silver tax. 
Annually the Dzungars extracted 100,000 silver tangas in tax from Yarkand and slapped livestock, stain, commerce, and a gold tax on them. The Dzungars extracted 700 tails of gold, and also extracted cotton, copper, and cloth, from the six regions of Korea, Kashgar, Khotan, Kucha, Yarkand, and Aksu as stated by Russian topographer Yakov Filosov. The Dzungars extracted over 50% of the wheat harvests of Muslims according to Qi Yi Shi 30-40% of the wheat harvests of Muslims according to the Xiyu Tuji, which labeled the tax as plunder of the Muslims. The Dzungars also extorted extra taxes on cotton, silver, gold, and traded goods from the Muslims besides making them pay the official tax. Wine, meat, and women. And a parting gift were forcibly extracted from the Uyghurs daily by the Dzungars who went to physically gather the taxes from the Uyghur Muslims, and if they dissatisfied with what they received, they would rape women, and loot and steal property and livestock. Gold necklaces, diamonds, pearls, and precious stones from India were extracted from the Uyghurs under Daniel Koja by Sawang Rabton when his daughter was getting married. 67,000 patman each patman is four picules and five pecks of grain 48,000 silver ounces were forced to be paid yearly by Kashgar to the Dzungars and cash was also paid by the rest of the cities to the Dzungars. Trade, milling, and distilling taxes, corvée labor, saffron, cotton, and grain were also extracted by the Dzungars from the Tarim Basin. Every harvest season, women and food had to be provided to Dzungars when they came to extract the taxes from them. When the Dzungars levied the traditional nomadic Alban poll tax upon the Muslims of Altashar, the Muslims viewed it as the payment of jizya, a tax traditionally taken from non Muslims by Muslim conquerors. The Qing defeat of the Dzungars went hand in hand with the anti Dzungar resistance of the ordinary Uyghurs. Many of them, unable to bear their misery, which was like living in a sea of fire, fled but were not able to find a place to settle peacefully. The Uyghurs carried out acts of resistance, like hiding the goods which were collected as taxes or violently resisting the Dzungar Orat tax collectors, but these incidents were infrequent and widespread anti Dzungar opposition failed to materialize. Many opponents of Dzungar rule like Uyghurs and some dissident Dzungars escaped and defected to Qing China during 1737–1754 and provided the Qing with intelligence on the Dzungars and voiced their grievances. Abdullah Tarhan Beg and his Hami Uyghurs defected and submitted to Qing China after the Qing inflicted a devastating defeat at Chao Mo Du on the Dzungar leader Galdan in September 1696. The Uyghur leader Emin Koja, Amin Koja of Turfan revolted against the Dzungars in 1720 while the Dzungars under Sawang Rabton were being attacked by the Qing, and then he also defected and submitted to the Qing. The Uyghurs in Kashgar under Yusuf and his older brother Jahan Koja of Yarkand revolted in 1754 against the Dzungars, but Jahan was taken prisoner by the Dzungars after he was betrayed by the Uch Turfan Uyghur Shi Bo K Koja and Aksu Uyghur Ayub Koja. Kashgar and Yarkand were assaulted by 7,000 Khotan Uyghurs under Sadiq, the son of Jahan Koja. The Uyghurs supported the 1755 Qing assault against the Dzungars in Ili, which occurred at the same time as the Uyghur revolts against the Dzungars. Uyghurs like Emin Koja, Abdul Mumin and Yusuf Beg supported the Qing attack against Dawachi, the Dzungar Khan. The Uch Turfan Uyghurnbeg Kojis Huahisi supported the Qing general Bandi against intricking Devachi and taking him prisoner. The Qing and Amin Koja and his sons worked together to defeat the Dzungars under Amursana. From the 17th century to the middle of the 18th century, between China proper and Transoxania, all the land was under the sway of the Dzungars. In Semirechie the Kyrgyz and Kazakhs were forcibly driven out by the Dzungars and the Kashgar Khanate was conquered. However, the Dzungar Empire was annihilated by Qing China from 1755 to 1758 in a formidable assault, ending the Central Asian state's danger from the Dzungar menace. Uyghur Muslims like Emin Koja from Turfan revolted against their Dzungar Buddhist rulers and pledged allegiance to Qing China to deliver them from Dzungar Buddhist rule. The Qing crushed and annihilated the Dzungars in the Dzungar genocide. The Dzungar Buddhists brought back the Oktaglik Afaki Koja Burhan Ud Din and his brother Khan Koja and installed them as puppet rulers in Kashgar. During the Qing's war against the Dzungars, Burhan Ud Din and his brother Khan Koja then pledged allegiance to Qing China in exchange for delivering them from Dzungar rule. However, after the Qing defeated the Dzungars, the Afaki Koja brothers Burhan Ud Din and Khan Koja reneged on the deal with the Qing, declared independence and revolted against the Qing. 
The Qing and loyal Uyghurs like Emin Koja crushed the revolt and drove Burhan Ud Din and Khan Koja to Badakhshan. The Qing armies reached far in Central Asia and came to the outskirts of Tashkent while the Kazakh rulers made their submissions as vassals to the Qing. The Afaki brothers died in Badakhshan and the ruler Sultan Shah delivered their bodies to the Qing. Ahmad Shah Durrani accused Sultan Shah of having caused the Afaki brothers to die. Durrani dispatched troops to Kokand after rumors that the Qing dynasty planned to launch an expedition to Samarkand, but the alleged expedition never happened and Ahmad Shah subsequently withdrew his forces when his attempt at an anti Qing alliance among Central Asian states failed. Durrani then sent envoys to Beijing to discuss the situation regarding the Afaki Kojas. Topic. Rise of the Sikhs in the Punjab During the Third Battle of Panipat between Marathas and Durrani, the Sikhs did not engage along with the Marathas and hence are considered neutral in the war. This was because of the flawed diplomacy on the part of Marathas in not recognizing their strategic potential. The exception was Allah Singh of Patiala, who sided with the Afghans and was actually being granted and coincidentally crowned the first Sikh Maharaja at the Sikh Holy Temple. Death and legacy Durrani died on 16 October 1772 in Kandahar province. He was buried in the city of Kandahar adjacent to the Shrine of the Cloak, where a large tomb was built. It has been described in the following way. Under the shimmering turquoise dome that dominates the sand-blown city of Kandahar lies the body of Ahmad Shah Abdali, the young Kandahara warrior who in 1747 became the region's first Durrani king. The mausoleum is covered in deep blue and white tiles behind a small grove of trees, one of which is said to cure toothache, and is a place of pilgrimage. In front of it is a small mosque with a marble vault containing one of the holiest relics in the Islamic world, a kerka, the sacred cloak of Muhammad that was given to Ahmad Shah by Murd Beg, the emir of Bukhara. The sacred cloak is kept locked away, taken out only at times of great crisis but the mausoleum is open and there is a constant line of men leaving their sandals at the door and shuffling through to marvel at the surprisingly long marble tomb and touch the glass case containing Ahmad Shah's brass helmet. Before leaving they bend to kiss a length of pink velvet said to be from his robe. It bears the unmistakable scent of jasmine. In his tomb his epitaph is written, Durrani's victory over the Marathas influenced the history of the subcontinent and, in particular, British policy in the region. His refusal to continue his campaigns deeper into India prevented a clash with the East India Company and allowed them to continue to acquire power and influence after they took complete control of the former Mughal province of Bengal in 1793. However, fear of another Afghan invasion was to haunt British policy for almost half a century after the Battle of Panipat. The acknowledgement of Abdali's military accomplishments is reflected in a British intelligence report on the Battle of Panipat, which referred to Ahmad Shah as the King of Kings. This fear led in 1798 to a British envoy being sent to the Persian court in part to instigate the Persians in their claims on Herat to forestall an Afghan invasion of India that might have halted British East India Company's expansion. Mount Stuart Elphinstone wrote of Ahmad Shah, his military courage and activity are spoken of with admiration, both by his own subjects and the nations with whom he was engaged, either in wars or alliances. He seems to have been naturally disposed to mildness and clemency and though it is impossible to acquire sovereign power and perhaps, in Asia, to maintain it, without crimes, yet the memory of no eastern prince is stained with fewer acts of cruelty and injustice. His successors, beginning with his son Timur and ending with Shuja Shah Durrani, proved largely incapable of governing the last Afghan empire and faced with advancing enemies on all sides. Much of the territory conquered by Ahmad Shah fell to others by the end of the 19th century. They not only lost the outlying territories but also alienated some Pashtun tribes and those of other Durrani lineages. Until Dust Muhammad Khan's ascendancy in 1826, chaos reigned in Afghanistan, which effectively ceased to exist as a single entity, disintegrating into a fragmented collection of small countries or units. This policy ensured that he did not continue on the path of other conquerors like Babur or Muhammad of Ghor and make India the base for his empire. In Pakistan, a short-range ballistic missile Abdali I, is named in the honor of Ahmed Shah Abdali.
<laughs> Durrani's poetry Durrani wrote a collection of odes in his native Pashto language. He was also the author of several poems in Persian. The most famous Pashto poem he wrote was Love of a Nation. Stadi shakyu lech mini k shwel yern sta de ishq de wino dak sho zegarana. Sta ph lar k bale y elmi cern sta pu mina k baili zalmi sarona. Tath rasham h z y zim a f arg shai ta tu h rishima zergai zimai farig shay. B lech ta m andazan d z h marn bay lay ta mai andekni de z l a r marona. Khrhmd Dunia Milkun Yir Shai K Har Sa Mi De Dunia Molkona Dur Shi Zama Bh Hire Nh Shai Da Sta Skli Bagun Z Ma Ba Hira Na Shi Da Sta Shekli Baghona. I will not forget it your beautiful gardens. Dly Tkht Hire of Ch Ra Yad Kame De Delhi Takt Hirawuna Che Rayad Kum Zama di skli pistanwa di gru cern zima de kekli or shekel pakhtunkwa de ghru sarona. Personal life During Nader Shah's invasion of India in 1739, Abdali also accompanied him and stayed some days in the Red Fort of Delhi. When he was standing, outside the Jolly Gate near Dewan, I am. Asaf Jha the first saw him. He was an expert in physiognomy and predicted that Abdali was destined to become a king. When Nader Shah came to know about it, he purportedly clipped his ears with his dagger and made the remark, When you become a king, this will remind you of me. According to other sources, Nader Shah did not believe in it and asked him to be kind to his descendants on the attainment of royalty. See also List of monarchs of Afghanistan <laughs>